Oh, hi, I, I didn't notice you there. I'm just here at the American Geophysical Union Conference. It's just the biggest earth science conference of the year because I'm presenting work that I've been doing at NASA for the past year. I'll be presenting it on Thursday. But I'm sure nothing important happened today, right? What? Something did? What, what could it be? Oh, that's right! Sora came out today by OpenAI and Google made a breakthrough in quantum computing on the same day? What? Huh? You know, I flew into Washington, D.C. last night at like midnight and I got like three hours of sleep. I just pointed six and I meant to say three. Three hours of sleep. And so my brain barely has enough bandwidth to make this video, let alone digest everything that happened today. But I'm going to do my best. So I'll start with Sora because I just watched that promotional video from their 12 days of open AI. Really impressive how you can create multiple scenes. You can generate scenes of varying quality, different angles. You can remix scenes. I really thought this was amusing. Taking woolly mammoth videos, making them into running robot woolly mammoths. And also you can create videos from images like of this lighthouse here. I really want to get my hands on it. I went to the Sora page. Not surprisingly at all, the page cannot allow me to make an account because it seems like everyone wants to make an account and generate their own videos. Totally understandable. I was in the middle of the conference the first day, the conference today, while all of this was happening, so I could not be one of the first people to sign up. I do look forward to this era because not only does OpenAI have Sora, it does seem to me that there are quite a few companies, particularly Chinese companies, that are coming out with AI generated video tools that look pretty darn realistic. I remember when we were looking at videos of people eating food and their faces look all weird and stuff. I guess for me, the big question is how are people going to use these tools? I mean, obviously it's going to be a really great asset to creatives. I'm excited to use Sora to generate clips for the channel, maybe just for stock footage. Obviously there are a lot of potential misuse cases that need to be taken into consideration. They did talk about in the video how there is going to be moderation and how they are going to adjust it based on users' needs. But I think we are truly entering a new phase of the game, I suppose. And I think things are just happening really fast. And I don't have access to Sora, so I'm not gonna to talk too much more beyond that because I really wanted to spend some time talking about the quantum computing uh, breakthrough. Okay, I took some notes here. The quantum error correction paper that Google put out is gonna be published in Nature, but you have to access it through an uh, institution. But if you go to archive, they have the preprint right there that you can read as well. They've also released a article on the Google blog to talk about the discovery. And so the main thing that I will talk about with this is that they have created Willow, which is a 105 qubit quantum processor that has been able to demonstrate the ability to reduce quantum errors as they get bigger. So let's try and break this down a bit. For those of you who are new to quantum computing, you have to recall that in classical computing, you have bits, quantum computing, you have qubits. In classical computing, bits can either be one or zero, but in quantum computing, they can be in a superposition, as in they can both be one and zero simultaneously. Thus, they will have the ability to perform many, many more computations than a normal classical bit can. The major problem, though, is that quantum systems are notoriously sensitive to their surroundings, and so you have to keep these quantum computers very, very cold, close to absolute zero, so you can reduce the possibility of like thermal fluctuations and interactions with the environment in order to preserve the quantum properties that these qubits can have. Now, the discovery that they made here is that the bigger they made their quantum qubit system, the more the errors were reduced. Reducing the error rate is an incredibly important aspect of quantum computing because these errors essentially will make a quantum computer less quantum and more classical and thus limit the usefulness of them. And because they're already difficult to create, getting to a fault tolerant system is one of the holy grails in the field. Now, what they've done is that they have created these sort of error corrected lattices. And so the idea here kind of in this picture is that you have to imagine these qubits sort of packed in a lattice 
And the reason you do this is to mitigate the errors. By sort of keeping them together, you're able to create sort of like a safety net that prevents errors from happening more rapidly. And again, errors are bad, errors make the quantumness go away, and thus by increasing the sort of safety net here, they were able to show that the errors were substantially decreasing as they built a bigger and bigger lattice of these qubits sort of next to each other and sort of working together in unison to prevent those errors from happening. So this is a really, really big breakthrough because they also have performed a benchmark calculation. So they use what is known as random circuit sampling, which is a benchmark that is a way to show whether a quantum system is performing better than expected compared to a classical system. And what they were saying in this paper was that they were able to get their quantum processor to perform a calculation. So this calculation on random circuit sampling was able to do something in, I think, five minutes, I believe, that would have taken a supercomputer, one of the fastest supercomputers, of, a classical supercomputer of today, it would have taken a 10 septillion years. That's a one with 25 zeros after. That's longer than the age of the universe. So that is just absolutely insane. And I am so excited because those of you who may know, I actually made a video talking about quantum computing and artificial intelligence and the emergence of those two technologies. Having a really powerful quantum computer will allow us to simulate processes at the quantum level so we can understand quantum systems better. Maybe this leads to better uh, medical breakthroughs because you can simulate those chemical reactions happening that you really need to have that quantum computation to do. And you can build novel materials, for example, based on these calculations if they are correct and sort of iterate faster on the development of new technologies. It's truly a mind-blowing time and I'm just so happy to live in a time where I've gotten seen so many different breakthroughs in my lifetime in physics. Now, there is going to be some caveats to this. Of course, with greater technological power, there's going to be concerns as to how we use it. Again, the video I made with AI and quantum computing, the Convergence book talked a lot about this and how there are multiple pitfalls we could fall into if we are not careful in terms of how these things could be misused, how nations can misuse them, how dictators of nations could consolidate more and more power and perhaps even expand their reach beyond their own borders. It's a really scary possibility, but one that we need to keep in the back of our mind. But I also think that there's also extreme hope and optimism as to how these technologies can help things in quantum materials, medicine, technology, transportation, just overall way of life. And uh, if you can't tell I'm really excited, I don't know what to do. I'm gonna have to wave my hands and just tell you I'm really excited. And I think it's interesting to me how unaware some people are of these uh, breakthrough technologies, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. I was just having a conversation with a fellow NASA scientist today who is in the Earth Sciences, a really brilliant, brilliant scientist whose background is in chemistry, but they aren't really aware of ChatGPT or Claude or Sora or any of these AI tools. They're really focused on their area of science. and. You know, what also doesn't help with this is NASA's policy on artificial intelligence, because if you look at the official NASA policy on AI, which I have up here, you know, generative AI content cannot be used on certain kinds of NASA data. And pretty much because it's kind of a slippery slope in terms of what you can and can't use it for, I would say virtually almost no one I know who is at NASA uses these tools, at least when it comes to being at work. And so I think even when you have really brilliant scientists who are not yet aware of what these technologies can do, it's gonna be really cool when they do find out what is happening. And I've been trying my best to express, not, I would not wanna say overselling, but just saying, hey, these things are pretty cool. I think you should check it out, see what it can do for you. And hopefully with this channel, also demonstrate just what AI tools can be used for from a astrophysics PhD's perspective. You know, I have a very limited scope in terms of my set of knowledge in the sense that I only really know one thing super well from my PhD because that's what a PhD is about. And uh, everyone else in their different scientific domains have different uses and applications for their own domain. So I just hope that more scientists get caught up to speed with this and that we'll be able to make more progress as a field together. I think I've been babbling too long. I'm really tired. And I think that's what happens when I get tired. I just start to blah, 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 start talk very fast. So I'm gonna stop now. I hope you can appreciate the excitement 
from my end and play with these tools. Uh, by tools, I mean Sora, for example, yourself. You can't really play with a quantum computer unless you have your own, except you can also go to Coursera. This is not sponsored by Coursera, by the way, uh, to take their hands-on quantum error correction course with Google Quantum AI. That seems like a really cool course. Those of you who don't know, I love taking Coursera courses, so I might indeed take this at some point. But with that, thanks for watching. I hope to see you in a future video. I will be presenting at this conference this week, so I will not have a ton of time to make videos, but I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. See you next time.